Lesson 12 for March 13 to 19, Desire of Nations, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, March 13. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we've discovered in the book of Isaiah and how it reinforces our understanding of you and the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. And in these past few weeks, we've come to understand more about Jesus. And this week, as we look at the grace of Christ and see him as our living Saviour, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us, not just in our study, but in our personal lives as well. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 3. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Let's read that again, Isaiah 60 and verse 3. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. From the book Faith and Works, page 36, we read, We must learn in the school of Christ. Nothing but his righteousness can entitle us to one of the blessings of the covenant of grace. We have long desired and tried to obtain these blessings, but have not received them because we have cherished the idea that we could do something to make ourselves worthy of them. We have not looked away from ourselves, believing that Jesus is a living Saviour. We must not think that our own grace and merits will save us. The grace of Christ is our only hope of salvation through his prophet. The Lord promises in Isaiah 55, 7, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We must believe the naked promise and not accept feeling for faith. When we trust God fully, when we rely upon the merits of Jesus as a sin-pardoning Saviour, we shall receive all the help that we can desire. End of quote. This week, we can see more of this great truth as revealed in the writings of the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> Sunday, March 14. The Effects of Sin In Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 3, the people ask God, Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? In contrast, Isaiah 59.1 implies another question, something like, Why do we call for the Lord's hand to save us, but he does not? Why do we cry to him, but he does not hear? Isaiah answers that God is able to save and hear. His failure to do either, however, is another matter entirely. Question, read Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2. What message is being given here that answers the question in Isaiah 59 verse 1? Isaiah 59 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. God chooses to ignore his people, not because that is his desire, but because, as it says in verse 2, your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God. That's the New Revised Standard Version. Here is one of the clearest statements in the Bible regarding the effect of sin on the divine human relationship. Isaiah spends the rest of chapter 59 elaborating on this point, which is seen all through human history. Sin can destroy our relationship with the Lord and thus lead to our eternal ruin, not because sin drives God away from us, but because it drives us away from God. Question. Read Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. How does this example reveal the principle expressed in the paragraph above? Genesis 3 and verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
Sin is primarily a rejection of God, a turning away from Him. The sin act actually feeds upon itself in that not only is the act a turning away from God, but also the result of the act causes the sinner to turn away even more from the Lord. Sin separates us from God, not because God wouldn't reach out to the sinner. Indeed, the whole Bible is almost nothing but the account of God's reaching out to save sinners but because sin causes us to reject his divine overtures to us. That is why it is so important that we tolerate no sin in our lives. And so to finish today, in what ways have you experienced the reality that sin causes a separation from God? What, in your own experience, is the only solution to the problem? Monday, March 15. Who is forgiven? Our text for today is Isaiah 59, verses 15 to 21. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness it sustained him. For he put on a righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak, according to their deeds. Accordingly he will repay, fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies." The coastlands he will fully repay, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon them and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Isaiah 59 presents a startling picture of the problem of sin. Fortunately, the Bible also presents the hope of redemption. To begin, the first question is, how many of us have sinned? The Bible is unequivocal. All of us have. Redemption, therefore, cannot be based on lack of sin. It must be based on forgiveness, as Jeremiah 31 verse 34 says. No more shall every man teach his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Paul agrees, all have sinned, as we read in Romans 3, 9 to 20. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practised deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, there can be no distinction on that 
basis, as we read in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Those who are justified can be judged as just only because they receive by faith the gift of God's righteousness through the sacrifice of Christ. Question. Read Romans three twenty-one to 24 What are these verses telling us about how we are saved? What hope should they give us in the judgment? Romans 3, verses 21 to 24. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Most people think the question in the judgment is, who has sinned? But that is not a question that needs to be asked, because everyone has sinned. Instead, the question is, who is forgiven? God is just when he justifies, the one who has faith in Jesus, as we read in verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The deciding factor in the judgment is who has received and continues to receive forgiveness by having faith in Jesus. Now, it is true we are judged by works, but not in the sense that works save us. If so, then faith is made void, as we read in Romans 4 verse 14. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of no effect. Instead, our works reveal whether we truly have been saved, as you read in James 2.18. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Question. Why can't works save us, either now or in the judgment? We go back now to Romans chapter 3, verses 20 and 23. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is too late for good works or obedience to the law to redeem anyone. The purpose of the law in a sinful world isn't to save, but to point out sin. Instead, faith working through love, as we read in Galatians 5, 6. Love that is poured into the heart by God's Spirit, as we read in Romans 5, 5, demonstrates that a person has living faith in Jesus Christ, as we look at James 2, 26 for that. But first, Romans 5, verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And James 2.26 For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Works are an outward expression, the human manifestation of a saving faith. Hence, a true Christian experience is one in which faith is expressed in a daily commitment to the Lord that is revealed by obedience to the law. In the judgment, God uses works as evidence for his creatures who cannot read thoughts of faith as he can. But for the converted person, only works following conversion, when the life is empowered by Christ and the Holy Spirit, are relevant in the judgment. The pre-conversion life of sin has already been washed away by the blood of the Lamb, as we read in Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. But if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness for God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin, because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For... When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Tuesday, March 16, Universal Appeal Question. What is Isaiah 60 verses 1 and 2 talking about? What principle do you see at work there that's seen throughout the Bible? What hope does it offer? Isaiah 60 beginning at verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Isaiah 60 verses 1 and 2, in there we are given a picture of God's deliverance of his people following the exile, expressed with the imagery of God creating light out of darkness and pointing forward to the ultimate fulfillment in salvation through Christ. Question in Isaiah 60 verse 3, To whose light do nations and kings come? The Gentiles shall come to your light, the kings to the brightness of your rising. In Hebrew, this person is feminine singular. As we see in verses 1 and 2, it must be Zion, personified as a woman, who is mentioned near the end of the previous chapter in Isaiah 59, Verse 20, the Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. So, the people of the earth who are covered in darkness will come to Zion. They will be drawn by the light of God's glory that has arisen over her. As we read in verse 2 of chapter 60, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. 
Zion, writes Alec Moyer uh, in The Prophecy of Isaiah, an introduction and commentary, page 499, Zion is summoned to enter into the light that is hers and then to observe and react to the nations as they gather to the same light. End of quote. Notice that although Zion is Jerusalem, the emphasis is more on the people than on the physical location of the city. The rest of Isaiah 60 develops the theme introduced in verses 1 to 3. The people of the world are drawn to Jerusalem, which is blessed because of God's glorious presence there. Question. How does this prophecy compare with God's covenant promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 2 and 3? Are they not saying the same thing? Genesis 12, beginning at verse 2, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God had a universal purpose when he chose Abraham and his descendants. Through Abraham, all families of the earth would be blessed, as we read in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, which read, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Genesis 18:18, 18, 18, So Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And Genesis 22:18, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So, God's covenant with Abraham was ultimately intended to be a covenant with all mankind through Abraham. He and his descendants would be God's channel of revelation to the world. Isaiah sought to bring his people back to their ancient universal destiny. As the representatives of the true God, they were responsible not only for themselves, but also for the world. They should welcome foreigners who seek God, as we read in Isaiah 56, verses 3 to 8. For his temple shall be called the house of all peoples, in verse 7. But let's read verses 3 to 8 of Isaiah chapter 56. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the foreigner, who join themselves to the Lord, to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, every one who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations." The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, says, Yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. So, to finish today, in this context, how do you understand the role of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or your role in that church? Wednesday, March 17, the year of the Lord's favour. Our text for today is Isaiah 61, verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Question, who is speaking in Isaiah 61, verse 1? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. 
The Spirit of God is on this anointed person, which means that he is a Messiah or the Messiah. He is to, as it says in verse 1, bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners in the uh, NRSV translation. Whom does that sound like? Compare Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 7. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged, till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. And this is where God's servant is described in very similar terms. Isaiah 61 verse 2 talks about the acceptable year of the Lord. The Messiah, who is anointed as the Davidic king and deliverer, proclaims a special year of divine favour at the time when he proclaims liberty. Compare Leviticus 25.10, where God commands the Israelites to proclaim liberty in the holy fiftieth year. It shall be a jubilee for you. You shall return, every one of you, to your property, and every one of you to your family. This means that persons who have been forced to sell their ancestral land or to become servants in order to survive hard times, as we read in Leviticus 25, would reclaim their land and freedom. Because the Jubilee year began with the blowing of a trumpet on the Day of Atonement, uh, as uh, we read in Leviticus 25 and verse 9, Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. We have mentioned this passage before in connection with Isaiah 58. While the year of the Lord's favour in Isaiah 61 verse 2 is a kind of Jubilee year, it is not simply an observance of Leviticus 25. This year is announced by the Messiah, the King, when he reveals himself through a ministry of liberation and restoration. This is similar to some ancient Mesopotamian kings who promoted social kindness by proclaiming release from debts during early years of their reigns. The Messiah's ministry goes far beyond the scope of the Leviticus 25 law. Not only does he proclaim liberty to the captives, but he also binds up the brokenhearted, comforts those who mourn, and brings about their restoration, as we read in Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 11. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigner shall be your ploughmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honour, and instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the law, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth. I will make 
with them an everlasting covenant. Their descendants will be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, as, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, far as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Furthermore, in addition to the year of the Lord's favour, he proclaims the day of vengeance of our God in verse 2. And so, to finish today, when was Isaiah's prophecy fulfilled? Well, let's read Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, and gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. How did Jesus' ministry accomplish this? Also ask yourself this important question. We, of course, are not Jesus, but we are rep to represent him to the world. What are the things the Messiah does, as expressed in Isaiah 61, 1-3, that we, in our limited capacities, should be doing as well? And what are some of the practical ways in which we can do these things? Thursday, March 18, the day of vengeance of our God. Our text for today is Isaiah 61, verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Question, among all the good news, why does the Messiah, as depicted in Isaiah 61, proclaim God's vengeance? When is this prophecy fulfilled? When in Nazareth, Jesus the Messiah read Isaiah 61 as far as to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour in Isaiah 61 verse 2, and uh, you'll read that in the story we read yesterday in Luke 4 verse 19. Then he stopped and said, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So he deliberately and specifically avoided reading the next words in the same verse, the day of vengeance of our God, in Isaiah 61, verse 2. While his ministry of good news, liberty and comfort was beginning to set captives free from Satan's tyranny, the day of vengeance was not yet to come. In Matthew 24, uh, which is also repeated in Mark 13 and Luke 21, he predicted to his disciples that divine judgments would come in the future. Let's read Matthew 24. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another, that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened." Then, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For, as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth.
Indeed, in Isaiah 61, the day of God's vengeance is the great and terrible day of the Lord, as we read in Joel 2.31, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And Malachi 4, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. To be fulfilled when Christ will come again to liberate planet Earth from injustice by defeating his enemies and setting the oppressed remnant of his people free. As we read in Revelation 19, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honour and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flaming fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God." And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great." And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse, and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped the image. These too were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone." and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And we compare this with Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. And in the days of these kings the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand for ever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. 
So, although Christ announced the beginning of the year of the Lord's favour, its culmination is at his second coming. So, a question. How do you reconcile the notion of a loving God with a God who also promises vengeance? Are the ideas incompatible? Or do you understand vengeance as a manifestation of that love? If so, how so? Explain your answer. Though Jesus has told us to turn the other cheek in Matthew 5.39, but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Elsewhere, he is very clear that justice and punishment will be meted out, as you read in Matthew 8 and verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Though Paul tells us not to render evil for evil in 1 Thessalonians 5.15, he also says that when the Lord is revealed from heaven with flaming fire, he will take vengeance on them that know not God, as it says in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8. The difference, of course, is that the Lord in his infinite wisdom and mercy can alone bring both justice and vengeance in a completely fair manner. Human justice, human vengeance, comes with all the faults, frailties and inconsistencies of humanity. God's justice, of course, will come with none of those limitations. So, to finish today, which of the following incidents would make you more likely to want to see vengeance returned upon someone who does evil? 1. A person who hurts someone you do not love, or 2. A person who hurts someone you do love. How do we understand the link between God's love for us and the warnings of vengeance? Friday, March 19. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 237, we read, Jesus stood before the people as a living expositor of the prophecies concerning himself. Explaining the words he had read, he spoke of the Messiah as a reliever of the oppressed, a liberator of captives, a healer of the afflicted, restoring sight to the blind, and revealing to the world the light of truth. His impressive manner and the wonderful import of his words thrilled the hearers with a power they had never felt before. The tide of divine influence broke every barrier down. Like Moses, they beheld the invisible. As their hearts were moved upon by the Holy Spirit, they responded with fervent amens and praises to the Lord. End of quote. And from the same author in the book Faith and Works, page 33, the day of God's vengeance cometh, the day of the fierceness of his wrath. Who will abide the day of his coming? Men have hardened their hearts against the Spirit of God, but the arrows of his wrath will pierce where the arrows of conviction could not. God will not far hence arise to deal with the sinner. Will the false shepherd shield the transgressor in that day? Can he be excused who went with the multitude in the path of disobedience? Will popularity or numbers make any guiltless? These are the questions which the careless and indifferent should consider and settle for themselves. End of quote. And here's a discussion question for this week. A Seventh-day Adventist pastor thoughtfully stated that his number one problem in ministry is the exclusiveness of church members who do not want others to join them. How can Christians take the love, hope and good news of Christ's kingdom to all the world so that others can have an opportunity to be saved before the end comes, when they do not even want to accept people who go out of their way to show up in their church? Matthew 24 verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So, to summarise this week's lesson, 
God purifies an unjust society by removing the rebels and by restoring the remnant who turn from the sins that have separated them from him. Due to the blessings of God's presence, people from other nations are drawn to God and his people so that they also can enjoy the time of God's favour that is proclaimed and delivered by the Messiah. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled I Want to Plant a Church and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Julio Ovalli was bursting with enthusiasm when he returned home from a global mission conference organised for church members across Mexico. He excitedly told his wife, Maria Diaz, about what he had learned at the event in January 2017. Now I want to plant a church, he said. Maria liked the idea. Let's do it, she said. But where to start? Julio wanted to reach out to a new neighbourhood and he thought a good way to start would be to teach people about essential health principles such as air, water, sunshine and rest. Julio and Maria won support from the North Mexican Union to work as volunteer global mission pioneers, and their church pastor also backed the plans. But some church members remembered that a previous attempt to plant a church had failed. This plan will never work, said one. You won't get any good results, said another. Julio, Maria and their two adult daughters donned bright green t-shirts bearing the name of the health program, I Want to Live Healthfully, and began to knock on people's doors. At each house they invited people to sign up for health courses at home and healthy cooking classes at church. The family worked intensively for four weeks and finally signed up the first person, a 60-year-old man named Rogelio, for Bible studies. When church members saw the family's diligence and learned about Rogelio, a few donned bright green t-shirts and joined them in going door to door. Before long, the group swelled to 15 people. The church members worked incessantly for six months. Seeing a growing number of people studying the Bible, Julio decided to form a small group to meet on Sabbath afternoons. He announced the plan to the church in February 2017 and invited more church members to join the effort. The church endorsed the small group and ten members accepted the invitation to get involved. Moreover, a church member who rented out a hall for birthdays and weddings offered the place free of charge to the small group. Twenty-five Bible study participants showed up for the small group's first meeting. Three months after being endorsed as a small group, the local conference recognised it as a branch Sabbath school. Seventeen months later, in September 2018, it became a church. Today, Puerto del Cielo, Door of Heaven, Seventh-day Adventist Church, has 35 members, including 24 people baptised through Julio and Maria's health classes. Sabbath attendance reaches 50 people. Plans are underway to construct a church building. Our goal is to raise up the church and to raise up more souls for the kingdom, said Julio, aged 46. And there's a lovely photograph here to the left of Maria and Julio. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.